so welcome back to our mass parts instruction videos and if you recall last time I had spoken about the readings as well as the homily and I mentioned that one of the good things about the Novus Ordo Mass or the English Mass is that we have the psalm between the two readings on a Sunday and of course we have it on, on weekday Masses also and I mentioned that that was something new. It is true that in the old rite prior to 1962 there were some psalms included there. For example at the beginning of the Mass the priest would recite Psalm 42 but it was very short and it was just the same psalm over and over again and also when the priest at the offertory when he blesses the water there's a psalm that he recites at that time also. Um, so yes, in the old rite there were some psalms, but not in the way that we have it now. In the English Mass, we don't have all of the 150 psalms. In other words, if we looked at all the psalms that we have throughout the year, they're not all there, but a lot of them are. And if you remember, the psalms are very beautiful. It is God's way of teaching us to pray, so it's the inspired Word of God. I also wanted to mention that when the priest finishes the homily, I think I did mention that ideally he should sit for a while and just have quiet time. But it's also the time after the homily that the catechumens would leave the church. So on a Sunday, the catechumens are those who are preparing to become Catholic. They are the ones who are taking instruction. So in the early church, they would leave the church at that point because the next part of the Mass, which would be moving on to the Creed, uh, as well as the Offertory and then the, the Eucharistic celebration, they were not yet ready to participate in that. They were not yet ready to make the profession of faith that we make when we recite the Creed. So the problem with having them lead is that usually their instructors, instructors would leave also, but then the instructor, instructors would have to come to another Mass. So in many ways it's not ideal, but it was just understood that because they were not yet prepared, and also out of reverence for our Eucharistic Lord. In other words, if somebody is present who is a non-believer, they would mock or ridicule our faith, or might mock and ridicule our faith. So our faith is something very important to us, especially the Eucharist. It's the source and summit of the Christian life. We believe it's truly our Lord. You may have noticed sometimes I speed up when I'm speaking. Well, I have a tendency to do that, but also it's because it's very cold in here. And sometimes even in our office, it's very cold because we don't have the heat turned on right now. So we're just trying to save on, on costs. So thank you to all of you for your donations. So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my way over to the chair and then we will proceed with a discussion of the creed and the prayers of the faithful. So as you followed me across, as you noticed, I bowed to the altar. And once again, that's out of reverence to the altar. So same as before reading the gospel, I would bow to the altar. And at that time, I would also say a prayer asking God to bless me and to bless my lips so that I may worthily proclaim his gospel. And that's actually, you know, there's a lot of scriptural things in the Mass. And that too is, is from the scriptures. So I believe it's the prophet Isaiah, at the very beginning of, of the book of Isaiah, when God calls Isaiah, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And an angel comes and touches his lips with a, a burning coal and, and he's purified or he's sanctified. He's made capable of proclaiming the word of God. So it is when the priest says his little prayer just before reciting the gospel. In regards to the prayers of the faithful, as you know, on weekdays, I would normally do the prayers of the faithful immediately after the homily, and then I would go right into the offertory. So it, the ideal is to have a silent time, a long pause, quite a long pause, after the homily, and only then have the prayers of the faithful. Now on Sundays and on all solemnities, we also have the creed. And there are two basic creeds that we can recite or traditionally recite, and one of them is the Apostles' Creed, and the other is the Nicene Creed. 
And as you know, we have these pew cards, these beautiful pew cards, which were uh, paid for and, and uh, organized by the Catholic Women's League of our parish. Of course, I had a lot to do with the actual designs and the prayers that are there. And a lot of people don't take advantage of these. So there is a prayer before Mass. It's good to prepare prayerfully. There is also the prayer after Mass, the thanksgiving for the Mass and for the Eucharist. It's the prayer to St. Michael. Inside we have the Gloria, the Nicene Creed, and the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the United States on most Sundays they would recite the Nicene Creed, whereas here in Canada we tend to recite the Apostles' Creed. Once again, I think part of the reason is because we have Masses back to back. The Nicene Creed is longer, so we kind of want to make the Mass as short as possible, not to extend it more than we should. I mentioned that ideally in many places the homily should only be 10 minutes, but it's not enough time. So some priests do go and preach a lot longer. And traditionally, especially before the time of the social media or even television, people, when they would come to church, they would love a long homily. It would give them something to talk about after the week. And, and it, was a, it was almost like a form of entertainment. So homilies or sermons rather were sometimes an hour long or even longer. And because people weren't bombarding themselves with all kinds of information, they also had better memories and they were able to retain what the priest was saying and to talk about it during the week. So even now it's a good idea to talk about the homily with your friends. And different people catch different aspects of it or they focus on different things. So, so it's good to do that. It's also a way in which we remind ourselves of what we have learned, what we have learned. So anyways, once the priest comes over, as I mentioned, ideally he would sit down and, and uh, just have silence time for a while. So on Sundays we would stand and we would recite the creed. So even when we recite the Apostles' Creed, there's a section in there where we bow. So at the part where it says, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, we would bow once again to honor our Lord who, was, who became flesh. So we're also honoring Our, our Lady, uh, who was the instrument through which Christ came into this world. Now note that it's called the Apostles' Creed. Was this creed designed by the Apostles, created by the Apostles? And most uh, historians, scripture scholars, or, or scholars in this field would say no, but they do say that it does date to the time of the apostles. So it's very likely or very possible that the apostles perhaps created it, or even if it wasn't they themselves who created it, that they approved of it. And why do we have creeds like this? It's even in the Bible, uh, scripture scholars say that certain passages of St. Paul is like a creedal statement. So in other words, when we become a Catholic, we have to understand what the Catholic faith is all about. Otherwise, we can't profess to be Catholics. So this is why we have a lengthy RCIA program, usually a year long, usually begins in September and, and sometimes after Easter. In some parishes, especially in the U.S., it's two years long. It's a two-year process. It's intended to ensure that they, the individuals understand everything that the Catholic Church teaches and that they are willing to accept everything that the Catholic Church teaches. So it's important to know what we believe, and the creeds are just a summary of the basic elements of our faith and a profession of that faith. So every Sunday we profess our faith, we are reminding ourselves of what we believe, but we are also witnessing to the fellow Catholics in the pews that I'm making my profession. And this is why when we begin it, instead of saying we believe, as the older incorrect translation had had it, we say, I believe in God. So the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven, earth, and so on and so on. So I am making a profession of faith in the midst of the believing community. And the ideal is that when I go out into the world, I continue to make a similar profession of faith by how I live my life and the words that I speak. I mentioned the Nicene Creed, which is a longer version. It's a more detailed version. It's a very beautiful creed. So sometimes during Lent, I will recite the Nicene Creed because since we don't have the Gloria, it gives us a little bit more time. So I feel it's good for us to be familiar with that. 
uh, same as with Advent when we don't have the Gloria. It would be nice if we had it more often. Some priests on every feast day, they will recite the Nicene Creed instead of the Apostles' Creed. And once again in the Nicene Creed, there's this part where we're all supposed to bow. For me, it's difficult to bow because I'm speaking into the microphone. It's not on right now, but I'm speaking into the microphone and if I were to bow, it would lose, um, my voice would not project. So I feel that I'm leading it. So what I've started doing recently is just to bend the mic down here. But they actually say that it should be a very profound bow uh, out of reverence for Christ and for his birth. And where do we get the name Nicene from? Well, it comes from the Council of Nicaea, which took place in the year 325. Now, this was just shortly after Christianity was made an official or acceptable religion by Emperor Constantine. So it was the Edict of Milan, which I believe was 306, and um, Emperor Constantine, if you recall, his mother was Saint Monica, and she was a Christian, so her influence on Constantine was very good. Constantine himself did not become a Christian until much later in life. At that time, people understood that when you are baptized, all your sins are purified, and, and even um, much of the temporal punishment for your sins is done away with. So they wanted to wait for baptism. Now, the danger of doing that is you don't know when you are going to die. So ideally, you want to be baptized as soon as you can. So um, there were controversies at, at that time. Emperor Constantine started building churches, so the Christians no longer had to celebrate Mass in hiding, but he, he built beautiful churches for them. He favored the church, allowed them to flourish. But there were disputes among some of the, um, the bishops at that time, and some of them were saying, well, Christ isn't really God because there's only one God. How can Christ be God also? And so the, the, uh, the Nestorianism, um, uh, or Arianism rather, sorry, Arianism, the belief that Christ wasn't really God was starting to spread. And some bishops actually believed it. So they were having disputes and Emperor Constantine wanted the Christians to be at peace. And so he made it available for them to convene at a council in the city called Nicaea and there the bishops kind of debated, kind of discussed it. But it wasn't a unanimous decision. In other words, it's not because majority rules or because it's a democratic process, but don't forget that the Holy Spirit was guiding them and ensuring that they would preserve the true faith. And there are many scriptural passages that support the truths of our faith. So it's Christ who revealed that, um, you know, that he has the same nature as the Father, that he is divine. So Emperor Constantine convened this council and the council declared that Christ is truly God, the second person of the Trinity. And so it's very beautiful when we recite the Nicene Creed, I believe in, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. The key word there is consubstantial, that he has the same substance as the Father, that he is divine. So we recite these creeds, as I mentioned, sometimes the Nicene Creed, sometimes the Apostles' Creed, and they are expressive of our faith and in many ways by reciting it, it strengthens uh, us in our faith, it reminds us what we believe, such as the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, not just for Christ, but for all of us. And on Sundays, after the we recite the creed, we would have the prayers of the faithful. So when we have the prayers of the faithful, the priest introduces it, and usually I just say something like, let us now raise our minds and hearts to God in prayer. We usually have the lector, or if the deacon were present, the deacon would read the prayers of the faithful. And the prayers of the faithful were not present prior to um, the Second Vatican Council. So in other words, it's, they weren't present in the old mass. So the prayers of the faithful are once again a reminder to try to make the mass more relevant 
to all the participants. So ideally, there's something in the prayers of the faithful that people can relate to. So for example, during this time of the coronavirus pandemic, we would pray that God keep us safe, or we would pray for the victims, or we would pray for the first responders. So by praying for these things, it's a reminder that we need to unite in the prayers of the Mass, that we need to offer the sacrifice of the Mass for all these intentions and for whatever personal intentions that we have. And in many ways, having the prayers of the faithful just before the offertory is very good because at the offertory, it's kind of a reminder that we're going to be offering or bringing things to the altar that's going to be united with the primary intention of the Mass, which is the intention of the Mass that the priest would have read out at the beginning of the Mass. So before we get to the offertory, um, I just wanted to say that at the end of all the prayers, the priest says a concluding prayer, and sometimes that concluding prayer can reflect on the theme that was in the homily, or the theme in the readings, or perhaps a major theme in the prayers of the, of the faithful, such as our dealing with the pandemic, the coronavirus situation. So the priest would say that prayer and then people would sit down. Often we would have an offertory hymn and it's also an opportunity for people to grab their offertory envelopes or, or to um, uh, get ready for, for the collection also. So thank you and hope to see you next time.